Right before we jump into this video, if you'd like me to send you a free guide to capturing motion in low light situations, just look for this orange box over on fronosphoto.com, put your name, email address in it, hit send it, I'm gonna send you that guide for free. Jared Poland, Fronos Photo. Dot com, and this is a comparison between the Sony A1 and the Sony A9 III. Now, I've taken both of these out into the real world. Of course, I've taken the A1 out for longer because it's been out for two years at this point, but the Sony A9 III has been in my hands in Africa, as well as photographing basketball games here in Philadelphia, so I have a pretty good understanding of how both of these cameras work in the real world. And in this video, I'm gonna help you decide which one might be the right one for you if you're trying to decide should you purchase an A1, should you purchase an A9 III, or if you haven't, an A1, should you consider the A9 III to replace it or wait for an A12? One of the biggest questions I got as soon as the A9 III was announced from all of the people that owned A1s is do they need to get an A9 III? Should they consider getting rid of their A1 for an A9 III? And a lot of the professional sports shooters that I talked to are like, we love what the A1 does, so we really need to know is the A9 III better or could they wait longer for something else to come out? And, and one of the main reasons is the sensor size. The A1 has a 50.1 megapixel full frame BSI stacked CMOS sensor, which is powered by a Bion's XR processor. The A9 III has something entirely new that the industry hasn't seen to this extent before. It is a 24.6 megapixel full frame BSI stacked CMOS sensor with a global shutter for zero distortion and it's also powered by a Bion's XR processor. So the big question there is 50 better than 24 and for a lot of the sports shooters the answer to that question is is yes they love having the ability to crop if they want to do that now if you're like me and you're not a cropper the 24 point some megapixels is perfectly fine i went from shooting a sony a1 to shooting a canon r3 personally which is only a 24 megapixel sensor and yeah i loved having the 50 megapixels but the 24 in this day and age is perfectly fine but the biggest thing we need to talk about is that global shutter that is in the A9 III. If you're new to this and you're not sure what the difference between just a stack sensor is in a more traditional sense or what a global shutter is for a stacked sensor, I'm going to try and explain it as easy and as simply as possible right now. So the sensor inside of the A9 III is stacked just like the A1, but it incorporates what's called a global shutter. And what that means is all pixels fire and record at the same time. So when you press that shutter button, boom, every pixel is reading. So when you've seen jelloing effect in your images or in video that you're watching and you see propellers that are just bowing and, and, and just don't look great, that doesn't happen with something like this that is capturing all the pixels at once. They all fire at once. In the more traditional sense, it's more of a scanning sensor. So what's happening is when you take the picture, it's taking it super fast, but it's reading pixels line by line. And in that case, you might end up with some bowing of a baseball bat or balls that might be flying wherever they're flying or in a golf swing. Now the A1 is super fast unto itself and you really don't see any of that bowing, but that is the major difference. Fires all at once and goes line by line. Does one get a check mark over the other? The answer is, I haven't even talked about check marks yet. So if you want more megapixels with the ability to crop, we get a check mark for the Sony A1. If you want the most revolutionary new sensor that is firing all at once, then this one is going to get a check mark over here. But there are pros and cons to both, and we'll get to more of that as we go down the specs. Now let's move on to the ISO. The ISO of the Sony A1 is 100 to 32,000 natively, expandable up to 102,400. The A9 III is native from 250 ISO up to 25,600 and is expandable up to 51,200. So it's not as good in terms of ISO range. And that's one of those things that has always been said about global shutter sensors is that there's a the ISO range can't be expanded as much because you start to get into areas where it just doesn't look that good. Now, in my head-to-head -head testing with the A9 III and Canon's 
R3, which is also a 24 megapixel sensor. It doesn't have a global shutter. And also the A1, when you put them side by side, you don't really see much of a difference. It's very difficult to see unless you're pixel peeping side by side that the R3 looks slightly better than what you found in the A93, but it wasn't to the extreme where you're like, yeah, that isn't good at all. It's perfectly usable and perfectly fine. No one's going to know the difference. And between the A1 and the A93, it is very similar at different ISOs. Both are producing nice images at different ISO ranges. The problem with the A93 is that your low base ISO is 250, where it is 100 with the A1. So in certain situations where you just have a ton of light or you want to do some panning or you want to do some slow stuff when you're trying to get photos, it might be more difficult because you're a stop and a third different between the two of them. Let me jump in here real quick because I want to show you our Lightroom presets from Fropac 4 in action on this photo taken with the Sony A1 starting with Blue's Clues followed by Brooklyn, C41, Copper Tone, DeLorean, High C, Kaleidoscope, Mel Brooks, Saltwater Taffy, Thick, Tintype, and Wet Hot American Summer. And my all-time favorite from Fropac 1, Skittles, with one click, looks amazing. But let me show you something for you portrait shooters out there, because we have adaptive presets, X1, X2, X3, and X4. Right now I'm gonna go X2, which is full body, and watch what it does. Look at this when I click on the mask. Look at all of the things that it highlights. Let's say we want to take down the facial skin. Look, we can take a, out some and we could put it all the way up, but you don't want to do that. It looks fake and she looks great. So somewhere around here looks pretty good. And let's say we want to touch up the hair. You could be like, okay, I want the hair a little brighter. You can do that. You may not want to do it, but you have the option. And of course, my favorite is I can control the eyes. I can make them brighter. I can make them darker. I can add some color changing. We can do a little bit of everything in there, and that is the adaptive preset. So look, if you want to speed up your raw workflow, give yourself a great starting point, or you want to use those amazing adaptive presets, we created 14 all-new custom Lightroom presets, as well as a couple of adaptive presets that you can check out right now at fronosphoto.com slash fropack4. While you're over there, you can play with the sliders to see the befores and the afters, and if you decide to pick them up right now, they are currently on sale. Or if you want to get fropack one, two, three, and four, and save even more, you can get the Grand Slam Bundle. Don't forget, these also work perfect on mobile. Now, let's get back to the video. For those of you who think about dynamic range and you're gonna be pushing and pulling different shadow areas, it might be more of an issue with the A9 III, but at the end of the day, I don't think you're gonna see much of a difference between both of these. They both are gonna produce fantastic results. Now, I didn't really mention what check marks are all about, they're not about very much. I make them up as I go along. I just like to give them. You can keep track at home who's winning or losing, but they really don't mean anything at the end of the day. Or do they? So who's going to get the check mark for ISO in this one? I honestly think it's pretty clear. The A1 has a much better range. It's more expanded, so it's getting the check mark this time. Moving on to frame rates. Let's talk about the A1. It has 10 frames a second with the mechanical shutter in 14-bit uncompressed RAW. You can do 30 frames per second with the electronic shutter in 12-bit compressed RAW, 20 frames per second electronic in 14-bit uncompressed RAW. You get lossless compressed options that are also available. Now with the Sony A9 III, you can shoot all the way up to 120 frames per second with the electronic shutter in 14-bit uncompressed RAW. That means, yes, 120 RAW files per second. That is unheard of and insane. You can also dial that back to 60 frames a second. You can do 30 frames a second. You can do 15 frames a second, but you can't go anywhere in between. Hopefully one day they let us dial that in so we can pick whether we want to do 24, 48, or whatever it is that we want to do when we're shooting. But the fact that you can shoot 120 frames per second is absolutely mind-blowing. Now, something else that separates these two cameras is that you have something new called composite raw shooting, which is meant to reduce noise. That's something that I haven't tested out yet because it's not available at the time of recording this. So this is an interesting one for check marks. I mean, 
No, it's not. The, the A93 absolutely wins the check mark here for the fact that you can shoot up to 120 frames per second in that super boost mode. It is, it's insane what this camera offers in terms of speed. That's what you get with a global shutter. The ability to shoot at frame rates that were unheard of before for longer than you could have ever done before. That doesn't mean the A1 isn't fully capable at 30 frames per second, which is already insane unto itself. I'm gonna be curious to see what Sony does with an A1 II if that's gonna go global shutter or if that's not, and are you gonna be able to squeeze out more than 30 frames per second? But absolute check mark goes to the A9 III. Now let's quickly talk about the mount for these cameras. They both have the same mount. It's Sony's E-mount. There's a billion and one lenses available from Sony, from Sigma, from Tamron that are all fantastic, that work across the board. There's a ton of different lens options out there and they are fantastic. So. Nobody's getting a check mark. You know what, Steven? Let's give Sony a check mark for that one right here. Bing! Now let's move on to autofocus. This is a big deal when you're trying to decide which camera might be right for you. The A1 has 759 phase detect AF point that's covering 92% of the frame and it does 120 AF calculations per second. You have real-time tracking, which includes humans, animals, as well as birds. Now over to the A9 III, you have a dedicated AI processor with 759 phase detect AF points, which now covers 95.6% of the frame. You still get your 120 AF calculations per second. You've got real-time tracking, which now includes humans, animals, birds, insects, cars, and trains, uh, and a new extra small, you know, for her pleasure, extra small, oh, and extra large for, sorry, their pleasure, whoever wants to get their pleasure, focus points along with updated AF settings. This is huge. The A1 has great autofocus. I thought the Canon R3 had better autofocus at this point than the A1. The A93's autofocus with that dedicated AI processor is whatever that means, it has that. It has, the zhush is just fantastic. It is on par now with where uh, with Canon. I thought Canon surpassed Sony, and with this AI processor in the A93, it's ever so slight different or just basically the same that you'll never notice the difference, but it is so much stickier than the A1. The autofocus is absolutely fantastic in this. We are giving a check mark to the A93. Let me cut in here and say that this video is brought to you by Squarespace. If you're looking to build your very own online portfolio, use what I've been using for well over 10 years now for my personal website because it's simple, easy, affordable, and I don't need to know any coding. I'm never going to know any coding. To get your 14-day free trial, head on over to squarespace.com slash photo. If you decide that it's for you, use the code photo at checkout to get 10% off your first order. Now, let's get back to the comparison. Now let's talk about the card slots. Both of these cameras have the exact same dual card slots. You've got two CF Express Type A slots that are backward compatible with SD cards, the UHS-2 versions of those SD cards. Now, I say this all the time, I can't wait for the day that Sony decides to switch to the CF Express B cards. They're slightly larger, they're not reverse compatible with SD, but that is totally fine. The reason I mention that is CF Express A cards are still almost three times as expensive as CF Express B cards. You're looking at 160 gigabyte cards. When you get into the 320 gigabyte cards, you're looking at upwards of $600 just for those memory cards. And with how fast these cameras shoot, you chew them up much quicker. That's why I personally would like to see them switch to those CF Express B cards, where a 512 card is only 179 bucks from ProGrade. So you know what? We're taking check marks away from both of these guys. Minus one, minus one. Since we just mentioned memory cards, let's talk about the burst rates with these cameras. The A1, you can do 155 RAW files when shooting in compressed RAW or 82 in uncompressed RAW. The A93, 192 RAW files when shooting in uncompressed RAW. When you're shooting at 120 frames per second, you can do that for 1.6 seconds, depending on how long you have the pre-capture set to, which we're gonna talk about in just a second. Now that one second is up because we're gonna talk about pre-capture. Oh boy, have I always wanted pre-capture in every camera that I've ever had. The way that pre-capture works in the A9 III is when you press the shutter button halfway down, depending on the time that you've set for it to pre-capture, 
files. It will do this in raw, which is absolutely insane. It's going to record those raw files to the buffer. When you press the shutter all the way down, it's gonna take those files that were pre-captured, throw those onto the memory card, and then with whatever buffer you have left, with whatever time uh, amount of shooting you have, it's going to then allow you to start shooting at that point. So when I was in Africa, I had it set to 0 0.03, which ended up being way too many burnt frames that I didn't need because every time I took a picture, it was capturing like another 12 and I didn't want that. But I would prefer to maybe capture three, four or five or be able to dial it in the way that I want. But having those options, again, is fantastic. It's fantastic. Check mark is 100% going to the Sony A9 III. Now let's move on to video. The A1 gives you full frame 8K UHD video recording up to 30 frames per second, oversampled from 8.6K, or you get a 10% crop in 4K up to 120 frames per second in 10-bit 422 with pixel binning. You could do Super 35 4K oversampled from 5.8K with no pixel binning up to 60 frames per second. And it also has a base ISO of 800 for when you are shooting S-Log3. Now onto the A9 III, since we just mentioned base ISO for log shooting, the base ISO for log shooting on this one is 2000 for S-Log3. And the reason for that is the stacked global shutter. It's, this is where you get the hit with that ISO. So you're losing out there just a bit. But the full specs are you get full frame 4K UHD video recording up to 60 frames per second, which is oversampled from 6K, or full frame 4K up to 120 frames per second in 10-bit 422 with pixel binning. It is distortion free with zero rolling shutter due to its global shutter and has focused breathing compensation built in. Sony also added something called AI auto framing which was found in their ZV line. It is pretty stacked, and I don't just say that because of the stack sensor. One of the only benefits, or there's a couple of benefits to the A1, is that log at 800 versus 2000, and you get 8K recording, which most people don't even shoot in 8K at this point. We're gonna go ahead and give a check mark to the A9 III for that, that rolling shutter freeness that you get from the global shutter sensor. Also, most of the 4K modes that you're shooting in are oversampled. That's gonna give you some really nice quality. Quality. Moving on to image stabilization in the bodies. The A1 is up to five and a half stops of stabilization with IBIS. It also has active mode stabilization. The A9 III gives you up to eight stops of stabilization with IBIS. It also has dynamic active mode stabilization, which combines both digital and mechanical stabilization, making it 30% more stable than the active mode itself. Eight stops? Eight stops versus five and a half? That's great. We're gonna go ahead and give this eight check marks. Now let's move on to the viewfinder. They both have the exact same viewfinder. It's a 9.44 million dot blackout free EVF with 240 frames per second refresh rate. But keep in mind that the A9 III can still be at 120 frames per second in high quality mode where the A1 isn't. Now because of that, we're gonna give 120 check marks. I'm just kidding, you can just give it one check mark. But they are basically the same viewfinder and it's a fantastic viewfinder. Let me jump in here real quick and say, are you looking to purchase an A1 or an A9 III? If the answer to that is yes, head on over to allenscamera.com or click the links down below. Those are my affiliate links. They help us to continue to make content like this that helps you to make decisions. And if that helps you make your decision, then please help us by using our affiliate links. Now let's talk about the max shutter speeds you get, starting with the A1. You can go up to 1 32,000th of a second. You also have a variable shutter option, which helps you when you're shooting in a flicker situation. That's how they used to do it before they got to something like the A9 III that has a global shutter in it. So let's talk about that. You can shoot stills up to 1 80,000th of a second. Yes, 1 80,000th of a second for flicker-free shooting. Because remember, you're capturing the entire image at once, the entire sensor at once. So any flicker that was happening, you'll either get it completely dark or you will have no flicker at all. But combined with the built-in anti-flicker mode in the A9 III, you should never run into that issue at all with having the blank frame. Oh, and I should also mention that's up to 1 80,000th of a second flash sync as well. If you're someone who works with strobes and flash and you want to play with the faster shutter speeds, you can't go wrong. <laughs> 
Excuse me, I'm getting over something, clearly. Um, check mark A93. Moving on to the screens on the back of the cameras, the A1 has a three inch 1.44 million dot tilting touchscreen. The A93 ups that game to a 3.2 inch 2.1 million dot four axis multi-angle touchscreen with touch and swipe menu and playback options, clearly making it better. I will just tell you that the screens on the back of both of these cameras are subpar when it comes to looking at them, whereas the viewfinders Absolutely fantastic. Color-wise, when you're looking at your images that you're taking or showing them to other people, make sure they shove their eye into the viewfinder. Now, with all of that said, this flip-out four-axis screen is fantastic. I hope to see that on future cameras. So it is better, and that is why it's deserving of a check mark unto itself for just flip-out capability, but it's better, higher quality screen, and it's 3.2 inches. Now, if you're like me, you might notice out of the side of your eye, you'll see it sticking out off the side. That's something new to me. I haven't seen that on other cameras. Not a deal breaker at all. Check marks going to the A93. Now let's talk about the body. I have never been a fan of Sony's bodies. They just haven't felt great in the hands. They felt cheap, slippery, and just not as good as say a Nikon or the Canon R3, which up until this point, I thought had one of the best feeling bodies when I held on to it. Until I held on to an A93. And when I finally held on to this A93, I'm like, damn. With the grip, because you have to purchase a grip separate, unlike with an R3, which has the grip built in, I was like, I think I like this grip better. I think I like the feel of this Sony better, and that's the first time I've ever been able to say that, even with the A1. The A1 feels good, but it just doesn't feel as good as the A93 in the hands. On top of that, they've put buttons in certain places so you could get to that 120 frames per second and activate it with a speed boost mode. There's a button that's right there in the front that you can get to it pretty quick where you don't have that on the A1. What I do think is gonna happen is this A93 body is basically gonna be the same body that the next generation of Sony bodies end up being. So any A12 should have basically the same body as this A93. So keep that in mind, but check marks A93 once again. And finally, let's talk about the price. The A1 comes in at $6,498, and the A93 comes in at $5,998, which is like, damn! That's a lot of money for a 24 megapixel camera at this point. That is extremely expensive, but the fact, I didn't expect it to be so close to the price of the A1. The A1, Fantastic camera, one of the craziest things ever introduced by Sony when it just showed up one day. It's incredible. But the A93 has some future technologies that are fantastic. If you don't own an A1 right now and you were looking to buy a sports shooting camera, something fast, something that's gonna be great for video, I don't know how you don't decide to go with the A93. We've shown that the ISO capabilities are gonna be very similar, even though this is 50 megapixels and you would think that less megapixels should be a cleaner image, they're gonna be very similar. But that's not a problem. So if you're starting fresh today and you need something right now when you're watching this and an A12 isn't out just yet, I don't think you can go wrong with getting an A93. Now, if you want the more megapixels and you want the AI focusing and you want the 120 frames per second or you want a lot of the tech in this and a better body, you might just wait it out for an A1 II. And if you're current A1 shooter at this point, I don't think you should dump your A1 to go to a camera like this because I still love the quality, the autofocus, and the features that you get out of the A1. This is by far not something that needs to be thrown in the trash anytime soon. You're someone who should probably wait for an A12 to come out, or even if you do need a backup, I might just wait for an A12 to come out and make your A1 the backup at that point. So what are you going with? If you're someone who has an A1, let me know down below. If you're someone looking between these two cameras, let me know down below which one is the right one for you. But I really appreciate you guys watching this video. Thank you very much. And that's all I gotta say, Jared Poland, Photo dot com. See ya.